Well, hello, everyone. Uh, that was pretty loud on my end, at least. <laughs> Welcome to Transcendent Philosophy. This is Seth here. And we got Stephen, our expert on all things anime, philosophical, and Mormon. Well, you forgot Nietzsche, but yeah. Uh, oh, and Nietzsche. <laughs> I, I, not, not all anime. I, I, I still feel like a novice a lot of the times, but I try to, I love, I love anime. That's why I moved to Japan because I love anime so much. So nice. <clears throat> I kept, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I made two videos on Vinland Saga. So I've, this is something I have definitely have some interest in. It's actually my, my first Vinland Saga video is my most successful video so far. And yeah, I was really, really shocked how successful that got, especially when season two came around and so I, yeah, I thought it was, a, I think it's a very interesting show. It's a, it's got a lot of real life Vikings in it. Like Thorfinn apparently was a real Viking at one point. And you have Leif Erikson, the guy who discovered America uh, and lots of other people. I'm not, I'm not a history expert. I'm just an anime expert. I just know some people are in the show are based on real people. Yeah, that was a super cool detail to learn after I think I watched the first season of Inland Saga and I was just too curious. I Googled, is this based on, mm -hmm. you know, historical figures or is it all fake? Well, yeah, it, from what I understand, the story is not based on like a true story, but it uses characters that a lot of its characters are from real history. Right, right. It's uh, it's more, uh, I mean, uh, if you were to guess the percentage uh, that it is historical, what would you guess? Um, I'm guessing not a lot. Like from what I understand, Thorfinn probably never went to America, like the real life one. I mean, it's it's really it, history that trying to go that far back in history is very gets very sketchy and iffy, and you're not entirely sure what kind of details are true. I mean, yeah. again, I'm not a historian, so I can give you an exact percentage, but I, I'd say the majority of the story is fictional. Right, right. I don't think it's based on true events. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand, I think Thorfinn was like, at one point in his life, he converted to Catholicism. So like there were some like real Christian themes going on, but. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that I'm, was not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm. I'm not, I know there's like, there's this one YouTube channel where he actually like goes through the various people in Vin Vinland Saga and talks about the real life counterparts that mm -hmm. I watched a couple of those, but it's been a while. I'll have to rewatch those. Right. Can you uh, tell what my background is right here? Yeah, that's, that's Vinland right there. Vinland. That's, that's, a, that's America. Yeah. I'm the promised land, the, the Viking yes. promised land. The Viking promised yeah. land. So, so cool. yeah, I was wanting to see if you could kind of give us a summary because what we're going to do here, we're going to summarize the video or we're going to summarize the first two seasons pretty quick. And then we're going to start diving into like some of the ethical dynamics that uh, that play out. So do you want to try to get mm -hmm. us started on that? All right. So it Vinland Saga begins... Hang on, let me let me bring up something real quick. Marcio. <laughs> yes, thank you. I don't know why, but I've been getting cough, been pretty coffee lately. I've had a oh, pretty dude. terrible cold, and then yeah. that's just, what happens. I kind of went off the deep end. That's what happens when you teach kids. When you when you're at school, the kids they just circulate all the viruses. I don't think it was that. I'm pretty sure it was the the uh, expired food I ate. So, ah, okay. But anyways, okay, here we go. So Vinland Saga takes place in the Scandinavian countries between 1002 to 1013 AD. So yeah, we're talking pretty, pretty a good while back, not super far back, but you know, it's, we start on Iceland, right? And there's this little boy named Thorfinn, and he dreams about going on adventures and slaying dragons and all that. 
And his father is this very famous Viking who's like known to be unbeatable. And he was once a proud Viking, but he escaped Iceland with this, with the love of his life and have just a peaceful life. But then, you know, then his old comrades come back. Uh, come and try to invite him back into the war and he, that's when he set, gets a group of young men to go out and sort of defend to try to defend um, themselves and so they go out on the ship but un, unbeknownst to most of the uh, I don't know if I'm recapping this very well it's been a <laughs> little bit since I saw the first but you know just to give a really brief uh, there's this one guy who is an old companion of Thor's who plots to kill because he deserted his men during this one battle. To And so Thor's dies. Thorfinn is super angry at the Vikings that killed him. And so he joins to get his chance to kill their leader, Askeladd. Uh, challenge, tries to challenge him to a duel, fails, and the he just kind of becomes a part of the Viking crew, and he goes on this long journey where he tries to get more and more opportunities to kill Asgard in sort of a valiant way in a duel instead of just killing him. And Asgard takes advantage of this and tricks him into killing other people for him. It's like, oh, if you kill this one guy, I'll let you duel me. And so Thorfinn just turns into this ferocious killing machine. But then Askeladd dies at the hands of Knut. And this just throws him, Thorfinn, off way because he wanted to kill Askeladd. So he, try, he charges Knut, but then he gets taken into slavery for trying to kill the king. And so then that's where season two picks up with the, where he's being a slave. And then Canute, meanwhile, is building up his empire bigger and bigger, trying to make a utopia, but, you know, killing a lot of people along the way. Eventually he makes his way to the farm where Thorfinn is being a slave and tries to take the farm. <clears throat> and Thorfinn goes to try to confront Canute, but he, First, he's got to take on a hundred blows from this one from these Vikings, and then until finally he's able to stand up and be like, "I didn't fight back because I have no enemies." And so he goes up to Canute and talks to him and tries to convince him to give up his dream of a utopia. In the and he's like, Thorfinn says that he's going to build a utopia in Vinland without violent means, and that he's going to. If if violence comes his way, he's just going to run away from it and keep running and keep running. And this somehow convinces Canute to give up on his his utopia dream. And he significantly reduces his army. And that's about where Vinland Saga season two ends. I hope yeah. that I did that. I hope I did this story somewhat justice. There's lots of details, of course. I ran over but we can talk a little bit more into those details as we continue on this conversation but that's the gist of it and then the the manga carries on after that there's like a there's a the baltic war arc where like he it sort of tests thorfinn's newfound morals and asks how far, how much is he willing to run away from violence what happens when his past catches up to him and people want revenge for his past deeds and oh, then wow. yeah and then he they are trying to gather supplies to go to vinland and then and then after that they try they actually do go to vinland and thorfinn has a wife and a kid and so they go and i'm not entirely sure what happens when they get to vinland you know what happens when they meet the natives i didn't get that far into my research yet but that's sort of the gist of what happens after the slave arc right nice nice i i didn't know all that i've only seen up to mm -hmm. season two so that's a nice little uh yeah. teaser yeah that's that's um, the teaser right so i wanted to uh 
introduce, I guess, there's a couple things that I, you know, I read into the plot some like, uh, you know, some archetypes and stuff. I wanted to bounce off mm -hmm. my reading of the plot to you to see what you think. Um, sure. Yeah. So one of the key things that I think, so Thorfinn, he has this massive transformation of character, right? And yeah. He, he kind of adopts this like passivism that is almost uh, just like it's a 180 degree shift. And it's so they I feel like they don't fully come. Uh, they don't fully articulate all of his thought processes as he migrates. A lot of it is like some unconscious shifting of thought processes. It seems. Mm -hmm. Does that seem fair? Oh, definitely. It, he, he really makes a really big transition from being all about war and revenge to suddenly being like, you know what? I just need to embrace <clears throat> my father's wisdom and say that I have no enemies and just try to live a, as peaceful a life as I can. And so it's a, it's a huge, huge flip that he makes. It's huge 180 degree turn. Right, but right. you know, I think they do it. They, they, they slowly. It's not like a crazy dramatic shift that happens in the middle of the story. They really build up to it. Totally, and it makes totally. sense in the moment. So, um, I mean, yeah, I'm trying to figure <laughs> out. There's two angles I want to go. I'm trying to figure out which angle is better mm -hmm. to go. I think there's, it's better. There's to go so many angles to go with this. Oh, totally. So I'm going to go the archetype mm -hmm. angle first. Okay. Archetypes, right? Sure. Um, so archetypes, they're kind of like patterns of character, uh, like different personality types. And you can like, you can ratchet up like uh, how extreme someone is. They could be an extreme version of an archetype. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so what I want to build up right now, I want to build up the Thorkel archetype and the Thorfinn archetype. Right. Yeah. And so okay, yeah. The I'm I'm putting these two as rivals and the show is contrasting these two archetypes. So Thorfinn is the main character and he goes from like revenge all the way over to peace, right? He becomes the archetype of mm. peace and nonviolence. And so what I would bucket him as is a Christian extremist. He takes Jesus's logic of love your enemies, turn the other cheek, you know, do good to them that hurt you. He takes the Jesus mm -hmm. philosophy and ratchets it up to an extreme level. Does that seem fair? I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. And so to he contrast that. Uh, he doesn't quite on. go full like Christian Christian, I guess you could say. But he definitely goes the extreme with the philosophy so, of it. Yeah, yeah. Christian philosophy extremist. Like he like doesn't that. quite get baptized and be like, go around with a Bible and be like, I'm Christian. But yeah, he definitely takes up the philosophy to a great degree, especially after he's listening in to, you know, his his master when he's on a slave, listening to his master read the Bible and listening to how Jesus is talking about the in the Sermon on the Mount to love your enemies and to do good to them that persecute you and all that really hits him hard. Exactly. He's definitely, but that one thing I think is so fascinating about Vinland Saga is there, it seems like they're constantly trying to contrast Christianity with like the Viking religion. You know what I mean? Oh, and definitely. So, Cause you have, so, you have Valhalla and heaven and yeah. they're, it almost seems like one would be hell for the other and one is heaven for the other. Well said. It's like well if you're said. if you're a viking you'd probably think that the christian heaven is hell but if you're a christian you'd think the viking heaven is hell. Mm. That's such a mormon way to put it, right? <laughs> well, that's what I am, you know. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but that's how they portray it in the show is like like when Thorfinn has his dream of going to the Viking hell or sorry, Valhalla. When he dreams about going to Valhalla, he sees it's just a dark pit, all these, the guys that are down there, they don't seem like miserable at all, but they, they definitely seem like they're, they're mad with bloodlust. 
and they're trying mm. to kill each other in it, but they won't die. And so it's like, they're just fighting this endless battle and it just mm. horrifies Thorfinn to no end. And it's like, mm. okay, I, I want to, I need to climb out of this pit because I don't want to sure. be down here. For sure. I don't want to be, I don't want to be constantly trying to kill people. I want to actually live a peaceful life. And that's, it's an intro, even if you don't believe in any kind of afterlife, it's still an interesting idea that your desires create your reality. If all you want to do is fight, 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 then you're going to live in a hellish landscape. But, but, but your point is they might view that hell as desirable, right? Right. They might, that's, and Vikings back then did. They, they right. thought, oh, that would be so awesome if I died with my ax in my hand and I went to a afterlife where I did nothing but fight people with my ax. That, that was a super ingrained thing with Viking culture. That's a perfect segue to Thorkell, the archetype of mm -hmm. the Viking extremist. This guy is a massive giant of a human, and he is just obsessed with love for battle. He's always constantly bloodthirsty. Yeah. And at, at first, he's presented as a simpleton. And Thorkel himself sure. is like, have these Vikings lost their mind? Why is he so excited mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. shedding blood? Like, but yeah. when you as you watch the show, you're starting to see his mindset. And he just takes the Viking sure. religion to the extreme. Like, sure. And he's every... just an absolute beast of a guy. I mean, when you first meet him, he's freaking chucking like giant stakes at ships. And you're like, holy crap, this guy's yeah. a monster. Literally. But mm -hmm. Thorkal, but his then, personality. But Thorfinn is able to take him on pretty well. And even even though they both get they both get really scraped up when they fight. Like mm -hmm. Thorfinn, he freaking he's he takes off his fingers and he takes out his Thorkel's eye, but he's still yeah. like, man, this is awesome. Let's keep fighting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thorkel is, you know, he's totally ecstatic about getting his fingers mm -hmm. chopped off. He's waving his bloody hand. He's like, let's do this again sometime. Like <laughs> <laughs> the whole concept, the whole concept of eternal bloodshed. Mm -hmm. That's like his heaven. Like that's what he yeah. loves. Yeah, you you nailed it. But the other thing I want to emphasize about Thorkel is it's not just purely bloodlust. Like he's offended when people don't go to Valhalla. Like the concept of his enemy being a coward is offensive. He'll 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 scold the enemy, say, "Come on, pick up your weapons." Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to like I don't want to rob you of your chance of Valhalla. I want to kill you during an act of bravery so I can send you to heaven. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so in his own <laughs> twisted way, he's trying to maximize happiness. He's trying to maximize Valhalla. Well, what's interesting is you could say he's trying to maximize his own happiness, not caring about anybody else's happiness. But don't you think he, he cares that other people go to Valhalla? Well, he wants to go to he he cares about other people going to Valhalla so much as it satisfies his own self, his own desire and need for battle. <clears throat> it's not like he's out here preaching the gospel of of preaching the gospel and trying to get trying to convert people. Like yeah, he preaches the gospel, but he he only wants to convert people so far as it benefits himself, kind of an idea. If, if you're a Christian and you don't want to fight him, too bad. He's going to force you to fight He because he only cares about his own personal happiness. Right. So he'll, he'll, but, he'll force you into it. But there's a couple points in the show where he doesn't attack the Christians, right? Canute, he just he decides to serve Canute. He doesn't attack the priest. Well, to, that's because my, he respects he respects Canute so much. He's like, oh man, this guy is like, I don't know, just something about him is just like, you got to respect him because he just, Canute, as soon as he makes this 180 transition from being this super effeminate coward who's just 
running away from everything to suddenly like standing up to his problems. It's like, Oh wow. You got to respect that to make yeah. such a crazy transition. For sure. Right. But to like me, he's maybe you entirely different characters. So I think a lot of that comes back to re respect. You always respect mm -hmm. people that respect yourself, that respect themselves. And especially yeah. if you put up this big affront to them and you stand up to them, then that's instead of cowering away, then that's, that's, res you always have to respect that. Even from I, a hardened warrior like Thorkel and Thorkel himself, even though he's obsessed with battle and all this, he still follows Canute because Canute himself <coughs> will provide him with battle. That's There's right. There's this and interesting he... segment where in the Baltic War arc where Canute, as soon as he's disbanded his army and he's like done with killing people and all that, Thorkel gets super bored and he just he just barges into this random person's house like, I need to battle somebody! Somebody fight me! And so, yeah, yeah he, he's, he's only following Canute because he believes it'll get him more battles. That Yeah, that is true. But I uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I think that the point where Canute earned his uh, earned Thorkel's respect was when when Canute proved that he was willing to die, like someone was about to kill him and he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't evade the attack. Yeah, is absolutely. The, is that the turning point? I I I'd say so because, like, I mean, the thing you got to understand about Canute is there's he was this he was like super unloved by his father he was always treated as a weakling and like he was super into christianity and all that but <clears throat> he and all that but then like but then like he had this sit down conversation with this with this priest talking to him about what is love and so this was like the big philosophical moment of season one is it's like oh love isn't Everything that we know to be love is just, how do I say it? To truly love somebody, you, you can't, like, love, what we love, know as love is, what what is the word I'm looking for? Um, it's like, uh -oh. <laughs> you, re you remember what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Um, I, I'm I'm a like when lost. you fit it's sort of favorism you know don't you remember the scene it's sort of like love is can be considered favorism oh, it's not, what, what we think okay. is love like when yeah, a father yeah, loves yeah, a yeah, son yeah. he's yeah, gonna yeah, put yeah. all resources into the son and not care about anybody else and it's sort of For like sure. that's not For love sure. that's that's like that's favorism that's um you're oppressing these other people for the sake of this one one person and that's what we usually call that love. And so it's like his, the ultimate thing is like, oh, the only way you can be truly all loving is if you're dead, because then that's when you just you just surrender to everything and you just you let be, beasts eat you and you, you just you don't complain about the cold. You don't complain about anything. You just let things happen to you kind of a thing. And you just become food for the earth and so it's like right. oh that's it's sort of morbid when you think about it but that is what causes thor that's what causes canoe to have this massive transition he's right, like right, oh, right. okay we i learned just, what we i learned what true to, love was yeah and he's like i just need to fully embrace whatever situation i'm in and make just make the best of it instead of constantly running from running away. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to add. Uh, well, so how do I add this? Dang it. <laughs> There's um, an image I want to add, but this uh, doesn't add images. What happens if I hit stop screen? Present, share screen, I can do this one. Okay. 
So are you familiar with uh, just the vague uh, general idea behind Peter Singer's uh, expanding circle? Um, tell me about it. So it's basically Knut's lesson that uh, this priest gave. So like uh, the idea is that love is love is contained within a scope. And so you can mm -hmm. have a bigger scope of love or a smaller scope of love. And so selfishness is just loving yourself and not loving anything else. But then you can expand that to love your children. You can love your family. You can love your tribe. And But the problem is at every layer of scope, there's always the stuff outside the scope that you don't love. And so that goes back to the concept of favoritism. It's like the Vikings love each other, but they hate the English. You know what I mean? Yeah, something like that. And so the, the Christian idea, the priest, he was trying to teach Canute, death is true love because death, you're just giving your nutrients to everything. You're loving right. the worms, the bacteria in the soil. You're loving the ecosystem. Everything is being loved. You're sacrificing yourself and giving mm -hmm. of yourself everything, right? And so maybe Canute at this point, like I think Canute twists it, right? Canute, he evolves like this extreme utilitarianism where it's okay to sacrifice the few to benefit the many, right? <clears throat> right. I talk about that in the in my second Vinland Saga video where it's like maybe mm -hmm. it does they don't talk about it expressly, but you almost wonder if his sudden definition that love, true love is when you're dead, does that mean that, oh, if I kill you it's justified because I'm just turning you into the pure essence of love. Exactly. I think that's what the, the they didn't explain it fully, but I think that's the philosophic transition. He's like, oh, it's okay mm -hmm. to, it's okay to sacrifice some people because I'm creating more love in the process. Right. 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 And so for him, it's like all of a sudden genocide is a kind of mercy. It's like yes. I'm I'm doing what's best. I'm I'm killing all these people, yeah, but ultimately it's for the greater good. Yeah. Yeah. And he has and he has this he has this kind of anti-god perspective. He has a bias against the natural sure. flow, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe I I'm not did you get did you fully understand what his bias against the natural order is? Uh, well, from what I understand is he, he understands that God is just kind of, he sort of comes to this epiphany in season one that God isn't going to help him. God isn't going to be doing anything. He's just, he, there, we're all down here. We're fighting each other. We're causing our own hell. So we got to take responsibility and build up a utopia for ourselves mm -hmm. to hell with God, to hell with what he thinks. He put yeah. us here to suffer and I'm not going to take it anymore is what can saying. Right. Right. You know, there's, there's this, he's really seeing the problem of evil in his own life. And he's like, if, if God is real, then like, he doesn't completely go atheist. He's, yeah. he just goes full rebel against God. And so yeah. he just, he's like, God put us here in this health and it's, we're just going to have to dig ourselves out ignoring mm. ignoring god altogether and so, so in that I, way he's fighting against god by mm -hmm. like fighting against the natural order that he put in place right so tell me if you think this is accurate or not maybe maybe from canute's perspective the natural order or the natural order is you know humans build a village and then humans destroy a village humans build order and then humans bring chaos and it's the mm -hmm. cycle of suffering. And he's trying to build a, a, like a meta order. It's like the normal order isn't strong enough to withstand the chaos. And so I'm going to wield the chaos. I'm going to wield the Vikings to create a meta order that can't be destroyed by the chaos of humans. Mm -hmm. And that's his utopia <coughs> that he's expanding. That's, right. That's, that's what he's doing. And so... And but along the way, he sort of he was told by his his father that 
the crown is going to corrupt you. It's going to turn you into a monster. And like, and so throughout season two, he's having these inner dialogues where he sees the severed head of his dad talking to him, trying to taunt him. Like he's this, he's the devil on his shoulder. And like, and so it's like, keep, keep, keep killing, keep killing. Yeah, you're doing it. It's, it's for the greater good. Don't worry about it. And so like, and he does some pretty crazy stuff. Like he, he poisons his brother just so he can uni- unite the two mm. kingdoms that were divided. And so yeah, like, and like, he, and this was his, yeah, he, this was his beloved brother that he, that he really loved and respected. And he went ahead and poisoned yeah. him just so he could unite the kingdoms. Right. And from Thorfinn's perspective, like, did you even try unity? Like, yeah. like, you it's didn't, like you didn't even try to sit down and have a conversation with your brother and be like, hey, you think it would be good if we merged our kingdoms together? Kind of an idea. But it's like, no, nope, he just had to go and straight poison him. Yeah. Yeah. Just such a pity. Mm-hmm. So. So, yeah, Thor, uh, Thorkel. I, so um, like the way I'm looking at this, there's kind of this there's two yin yangs going on. So initially I was building up the yin yang between Thorfinn and Thorkel, right? The ultimate mm-hmm. Christian versus the ultimate Viking. But then Knut and uh, as, uh, as, oh, fr- I'm screwing up his name, Askeladd. <laughs> Knut yeah, and Askeladd, they're kind of two different yin yangs philosophically as well. Um, yeah. The way I would describe Knut and Askeladd is. Canute is willing to sacrifice the minority to, to benefit the majority, and Askeladd is willing to sacrifice the mi- majority to benefit the minority. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that definitely sounds fair. It sounds like they're they're really more concerned about their own individual people. Askeladd, throughout the entire series, was only concerned about his crew. He didn't care about anything else. He he and he only cared about his crew, and that's what made his crew love him so much. That's why they were willing to go charge into a battle carrying a freaking ship on their shoulders, and mm-hmm. because they they had their full trust in Askeladd, and Askeladd was just charging into battle, and that that's just such a crazy scene. And then he comes, mm-hmm. and then they they like they put the boats in the water, and they go around to invade the castle and then they take all the treasure and Askeladd's coming out wearing all these jewels and a crown and it's like it's yeah. such a such a stud right it, wearing a yeah. king's crown like exactly I'm the boss <laughs> yeah 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 um but with with Askeladd there's a really big plot shift where we get to know more of Askeladd's thinking right and mm-hmm. Askeladd from his perspective, the world is full of corrupt people, right? He actually despises the Danes, right? Oh, absolutely. I, his father was a Dane, and he despised his father. He's like corrupt. You know, they just kill well, people. That mainly, mainly has to do with the fact that his father wasn't very nice to him. To be right, like originally, <coughs> he was just he was this the bat. He was his bastard child to Mm -hmm. this this poor slave girl who and turned out to be like a descendant of king arthur and so it's like oh Mm -hmm. i'm supposed to be the one ruling not these guys right but i i think the interesting thing about Askeladd is he views his mother as a good human right and he views his father as a bad human and then he does this he does this projection game right He's like, well, my father represents all of the Danes, and so all the Danes are bad. And my mm. mother, she represents Wales, all the Welsh people. And so all the Welsh are good, right? Right. And so he's got this perspective. The whole world can burn. I'm going to die to save Wales because that's where the good people are. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Whereas Canute would say, I'm going to sacrifice <laughs> Wales to benefit my utopia, this big majority. Right. So it's, they had very it's opposite like, takes. It's very flipped utilitarianism going on. Exactly. But this, the interesting thing is, 
the character of humanity is is so relevant. I think when we're talking about ethics, we often forget how important our judgment of the human's character is, right? If mm -hmm. we think your if we think your character is that of a murderer, your value goes down, if not negative. And if we think you're a saint, like your value goes way up, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And it's really hard to get out of those those archetypes. As soon as somebody puts you in that place in their mind, no mat it doesn't matter if if you if you killed somebody at one point, like Thorfinn, for example, if there's a lot of people, especially in like the Baltic War arc, view him as nothing but than a more um, than a murderer, even though he's he's trying to be a, a good a better person. And it's like as soon as you as soon as you get put in saint or murderer, it's like you could be a saint, or you you could do this really awesome thing, and then people call you a saint, but then you go and do this horrendous thing. For some reason, they're still going to call you a saint. Or if you if people traditionally know you as a murderer, it doesn't matter how many good deeds you do, they're still going to see you as a murderer. <laughs> That's such a good point. I actually have a I've brainstormed a solution to this that I want to bounce off of you. We're, sure. we're getting off we're getting taken off track, but this is good. Sometimes going um, off track is good. Yeah. Let's see. How do I add this again? Uh, okay. All right. So I have a blog on Brotherhood of Path Peace, and I have a graphic probably at the bottom down here. Or is this it? Okay. So actually, the solution is Christianity. <laughs> or okay. Right. There's one, maybe there might be one thing. Well, maybe we can talk about that later. Okay. So do you see an image here, the cycle of revenge? Yeah, I see the cycle of revenge. So what I'm trying to articulate... You got this Luke very... Skywalker versus Kylo Ren going on. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about the details. Mm. It's the, the idea are those is... Ac are uh, those action figures? Those look like probably. action figures. Most likely, yeah. So the idea yeah. here is that you've got hero versus villain and both sides of the equation view themselves as the hero, right? This is right. the, uh, this guy, he's, he's frustrated because he thinks he's the hero fighting a villain. This guy has the same exact mentality. I'm the hero fighting this villain, right? And mm -hmm. like th they get stuck in this tit for tat downward spiral where it's like, how dare you attack me? I must get revenge. And then the other guy's like, how dare you attack me? I must get revenge. And it just keeps and going. It, I mean? it usually starts off with some weird misunderstanding about yes. why somebody did something or like confusion on some matter. And it's like, instead of sitting down to talk about, okay, why are we confused about this? It's just, oh, you're mm -hmm. just, you're just the enemy and I need to tear you down. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it goes back to tribalism. <laughs> we still have these, even though we've evolved as much as we have, we still have monkey brains that still can only think in selective groups. We mm -hmm. can only know so many names. We can only be true friends with so many people. And so we have, we always have this tendency to fall back into tribalism and mm -hmm. be like, I'll never be able to understand you. So you're just my enemy forever. Right. Have just, um, have you seen uh, uh, Robert Sapolsky's evolution lectures on YouTube? I don't think I have, no. Oh, well, your description of this problem is exactly how he described it. You, you sound as mm -hmm. if you've, uh, you've learned about it already. Because right. um, this, whole, this whole tit for tat, right, this revenge cycle, um, in evolutionary logic, they've, um, they call it tit for tat. And um, they use software to like measure how tit for tat works. And uh, when they do the software simulations, they have these little software, little creatures that fight each other and they get stuck in cycles of revenge based on miscommunication. And so what they found is right. the, way to, the way to fix it is to introduce forgiveness. Once you introduce forgiveness, the cycle of revenge dissolves, right? So like a Christian right. principle starts to unwind the cycle. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Naruto, yes. Yeah. Very cool. Mm-hmm. And that's kind uh, of what Nar- Naruto does. He does the Christian path, the forgiveness path, right? Sure. Like he's he's like in Naruto, he's the only one who at one point he's the only one who wants to bring Sasuke back. Everybody else is like, oh, Sasuke's a lost cause. We might as well kill him. And it's like even Sakura stoops to this mentality, but Naruto's the only one who's like, No, I got there's still good in him. I know it. I gotta I just got to beat the crap out of him and convince him that <laughs> to be good again. <clears throat> just knock some sense into him and all that. Right. And eventually that's sort of what happens. But first he had to understand Sasuke. So like originally in the first part of Naruto, he couldn't understand Sasuke because Sasuke is all like, oh, you, you've never experienced loss. You're alone from the beginning. <clears throat> But then Naruto does experience loss in part two when he loses Jiraiya. And so it's like, oh, now he's a step closer to finally understanding Sasuke. And so it, it all begins with this. I need to, I need to, before you can like talk with somebody, you really need to understand where they're coming from. And a, a lot of that comes down to shared experience because it doesn't matter how, how well you try to describe something. If you haven't experienced something just like the other person, it's very hard to connect to that person, especially with something as dramatic as losing a loved one. Like if you've never experienced that in your life, if you've never had to deal with the consequences, there's so much just built build up in it and complexity that makes it very hard for some humans to connect. But, you know, you got to try anyways. Right. So the key, um, the key aspect of this um, is brotherhood, right? Naruto treats mm-hmm. Sasuke like a brother. And when you boil down brotherhood, what is it? It's, it's basically loving someone as if they're family, right? Yeah. And so instead of treating Sasuke like an enemy, he, he loves his enemy. He loves him as a brother, right? Right. And, and so when you treat people like that consistently it unwinds the villain narrative. Like each mm-hmm. act of love, it's like, wait, I thought you were a villain, but you're treating me with love. It's like, I'm getting this cognitive dissonance here. And then, you know, I've got to invent a conspiracy theory to like mm-hmm. keep, I got to keep you bucketed as a villain with this, you know, mental gymnastics. But with consistent love, you, you're you just constantly debunking all their conspiracy theories. And then they just have to accept, okay, you're you're not a villain and i should treat you better right mhm yeah absolutely so so yeah this is kind of a tangent but this is this is um talking about that cycle you were uh mentioning <clears throat> mm-hmm. so you can once you've got it on the positive direction you can build a better and better friendship with continuing the pattern in a good direction right right Absolutely. And there's just so many people in this world that need to, that need to learn that concept in general, like there's so many anti people out there that they're anti this or anti that. And it's just, it gets super annoying sometimes, especially when you see somebody go down that path hard and it's like, come on, man, I liked you. And then you had to do that. And, but when, when you, And I think the thing that we really need to sit down to understand is even though we have lots of like various different experiences with life, we're still fundamentally human at our core. That's what I'm learning about over here in Japan. It's like, yeah, I have no idea what these people are saying, what's coming out of their mouths. I don't know what this kanji is. What the heck? These weird (laughs) symbols. But they're still human fundamentally sure. deep down on side they still think like humans they still feel like humans they still have passions and ideas and they still have ambitions of their own and so to for me to treat the japanese people as anything less than human would be a huge disservice to them and so i you there's there's this crazy uh habit that one of the great great habits of japanese people that i think westerners need to adopt is they bow a lot 
you know, as yeah. a real sign of respect. It's like, even when they're, they're all about respecting people, even when you go to the grocery store and you're buying groceries, they hand you your, your receipt. Like I didn't get the, yeah. from us. it's like, Oh, yeah. you're like, you're, you're freaking like giving me my receipt. Like it's a gift. Okay. Holy crap. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how to, how to, how to respond to that. Right. It's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I like think that from a, from a Western perspective, <laughs> they're they're always so yep. so freaking polite. Like there was this one time where I was driving down the road. Mm-hmm. I got this guy on a motorcycle knocks on my door and he's like, he in the best way he can, he tries to tell me that my door isn't fully closed. So it's like, oh, I'd never get that in America. <laughs> so I had to go and do that. It's like, why are you telling me this? Yeah. I, I spent two years, well, I spent two years as a missionary in Taiwan, and I spent two years as an English teacher in Taiwan. And mm-hmm. I definitely took, there's a lot of things that I feel like, you know, there's a lot we can learn from each other. I totally agree with that. Absolutely. I, it's, it's so nice to go and experience a different person's culture. And like, yeah. like it's like, I, I really need to get more into Buddhism and Shintoism while I'm out here because I the more I study those things the more that I realize that even though I'm a Mormon there's still a lot of connections that can be made you know I think a lot of it goes back to the collective unconscious there's so many things that we can connect dots that we didn't think we could connect dots to yeah for sure well should we get into the ethics of this um sure I think-, I think i think what's what could be interesting is talking about how people get into these revenge spirals to begin with because you know as i i don't know about you but i kind of i had this i had a really weird epiphany when i was watching vinland saga you had this very christian experience with that i had a bit of an antichrist experience with it wow like, that's interesting well, I, because I've been reading too way too much Nietzsche. And ah, I was, okay, okay. I, I've read his book. I've read his book, The Antichrist. And mm-hmm. but what's interesting about and so I've been drawing. I was drawing all these parallels with it. But one of the main things that I got out of it is people take revenge in many different ways. Like I don't think Nietzsche was, even though he called himself an antichrist. I think that was more of like a boastful thing. He wasn't like super anti Christ, like the the actual person Christ. He actually really admired him. He called him a free spirit and all that. It was the way that people that Christians carry on his teachings that really got distorted. And so a lot of it comes back to I drew a lot of parallelisms with slave mentality. When you're being oppressed by these people, you you start to imagine revenge fantasies in your head. And that's what the all some Christians do in the show. And like they, when the Vikings invade this little this this little house in the middle of winter, before that they're talking about how evil the Vikings are, and like, oh, don't worry, they're gonna go to hell, and one day the second coming's gonna happen, and they're just gonna get wiped off the face of the planet. And that's them putting revenge fantasies into their kids' heads. And so there's mm. there's lots of different ways to. Like it's revenge doesn't just come out in physical ways. It can also be mental. It can be, you have this revenge fantasy that one day my God is going to come in and destroy your God kind of an idea. Like, Oh my God, Yahweh is so superior to these, these North Norse gods like Odin and Thor. He's going to come in and destroy you, destroy your gods and all that. Meanwhile, the, the Vikings have the same kind of mentality where they're they're constantly talking about how oh thor is so much better than jesus and we're gonna send you guys all to we're gonna force you guys into valhalla and all that and so that those were the interesting ways that i drew comparisons is it's like <clears throat> no matter which side you are there's always going to be a tribal mentality going on inside your head where you're going to try to and and it's like yeah people people still think that way today even a lot of christians they still have those revenge fantasies even if you're not willing to carry out revenge 
you're still there's still the sin of thinking revenge you know it's like as jesus said you can't just look at a, you can't just it's not just about going after a woman and all that if you just look at her and you just have that thought of lust that's still mm-hmm. sinning kind of an idea if you I like if that you're a lot. looking at yeah if you're looking at and it's 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 interesting how much people forget about a lot of christians forget about the teachings of jesus that are all about stop viewing people as your enemies and it's like like when paul was talking to romans he wasn't like oh your gods suck he was like (laughs) hey you know that you know that you know that monument to the unknown god yeah i'm going to tell you about him he tried to connect to people he tried to understand where they're coming from and be like yeah i'm gonna i'm not gonna disregard your beliefs i'm gonna sit here and be like how can we make connections kind of an idea Mm -hmm. and that's that's something that a lot of people need to learn is how to make those connections and try to, instead of trying to destroy other people's ideas and beliefs and try to take revenge on them and have these revenge fantasies, how can we connect the dots here? Cause you'd be surprised what kind of, de- caught, what kind of dots you can connect. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that it kind of goes back to what we are saying about like the, how you view the someone's character. Mm-hmm. Um, so like if the religious mentality, if they tell you that, you know, people outside your religion are evil, then you'd be like, well, it's okay for God to like massacre these people. Cause they're kind of scum. Right. You know what I mean? That's like, it defies the loving your uh, neighbor kind of a thing. But, Definitely. So like uh, on this, on this chart, I have religion, right? Do you see religion mm-hmm. on the circle? And so yeah, the interesting it's, it's pretty pretty far up there. Yeah, so like compared <coughs> to compared to like tribalism, religion is awesome. It's like, you know, we can make right. you can make friends with Japanese Mormons and you you go to a church in Japan. Yeah, yeah. I th- I think it's freaking awesome that there are that there are church people here and it's like, yeah, I don't know what they're saying, but you know, they still they still pass the sacrament, they still say amen, they still, you know, have priesthood meeting, religious society meeting, Sunday school. And so I think it's awesome being in a religion where I can go and not feel like I'm alone and like, yeah, I still don't know what you guys are saying, but it's cool how everything is still pretty. I'm still able to relate to things. Yeah. And that's what what I would also help hope to expand towards Buddhists and Shintoists. Mm. So like maybe I need to figure out what, if there are any like Buddhist meetings going on or anything like that and try to, attend one that would be a great way to build connection (laughs) for sure right but uh what i want to articulate with this layer of religion religion has a superpower when you go to church what do you call each other you say brother and sister right? right you refer you refer to people at church as brother and sister so what you're doing you're hacking into the concept of brotherhood inside your brain right and so you're you're instantly building a tribe with people who do not have a genetic relationship to you, right? Right. And so instantly these people, it's like, okay, so all of the Mormons are the good people. You know, the, the Japanese Mormons are the good people, the, the, the American Mormons, the Latin America Mormons. These are all the good mm-hmm. people. But then the danger is, all of the non-Mormon right. Japanese are the bad ones. All the non-Mormon Americans sure. are the bad ones. That's the risk. Well, there's there's still always, I think no matter what, there's always going to be that monkey tribal brain going on in the back that like, sure, you're building up these layers, but there's the tribe is still a part of the layers. And so it's about kind of putting that to the side and trying to just view people like even if I think if I had stayed in Utah my whole life or even just stayed in America my whole life just experiencing American things like I would like first coming over here I I thought it was the weirdest thing like why would you be Japanese and Mormon when like like, (laughs) it's like when the majority of people are Buddhists over here and it's like oh you're you're adopt you're Japanese but you're adopting this weird American religion 
okay, but it's still interesting to come over here and experience that. But then you still need to escape the religion bubble because, okay, now I'm here, I'm experiencing that they still do the same religion as I do. But now I need to experience that they're doing the, that other people outside the religion are still experiencing humanity the same way I experience it. Exactly. If you can connect at that human layer, you create like the, the biggest tribe possible. There's, there's no enemies, right? What is the, the line from Vinland Saga? You have no enemies. Mm -hmm. You try to view your tribe as the human tribe. It's like, you're not, I'm not the white tribe. I'm not the American tribe. I'm just the human tribe. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, yeah, I had a, I yeah, had no you were enemies, saying, yeah. You, you were saying I was inspired it's about by <clears throat> that idea of going beyond good and evil. It's about truly just seeing past whatever sins or good deeds somebody's committed and just viewing them as, as a friend as best mm -hmm. you can. Right. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhere controversial right now. Are you ready for a controversy? Oh, dang, we got a big lag. I like controversial things. Okay. I like controversial things. Give it to me. Okay. So when it comes to religious religion, um, I feel like you can measure the, the, you can measure a religion against how universal it is. So some religions might have smaller scopes of love and some religions might have bigger scopes of love. And, and the next mm -hmm. layer of controversy is the Bible itself is not a coherent text, okay? So the Old Testament is extremely tribal. The Old Testament has a very narrow scope of love. You know, it's just the Israelites. The Israelites are the good guys. Palest uh, the, uh, the Philistines, it's okay to genocide them. The Amalekites, it's okay to genocide them. The Ammonites, it's okay to genocide them. It's just the Israelites. This is where the good stuff is. You know what I mean? Uh, are you still there? feel like I lost you. Uh-oh. Hello? Well, uh, uh, I think, are you back now? Yeah, sorry. That had went through a bit of a bad connection. So you're talking about how the Old Testament can be super tribal itself. And now it's like a lot of it is, oh, yeah, go ahead and genocide those people. Who cares? Go ahead and shout and their walls will come down. And it's like, holy crap, how do you how do you go through Joshua and judges and be like, wow, these people are so freaking, and not say, wow, these people are so freaking tribal. They they only care about other Israelites. It's like, who yeah. cares about other people? Yeah, I, I totally get that. And it's a huge problem that Christians and Jews and Muslims have to deal with that they aren't, more often than not, they're not willing to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so along those lines, I for from my perspective, True Christianity sacrifices the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just gone, mm -hmm. like completely gone. Like, just forget about it. True Christianity is the four gospels, right? It, it's Jesus's teachings. Hang out with the sinners. Don't judge. Turn the other cheek. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hurt you. And, and die without fighting back because that's how big your love is. That's true right. Christianity. Anything less than that is corrupted by Old Testament or it's corrupted by revelations. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, cor it's corrupted by something else. True Christianity is just that. Right. <clears throat> and, and it's definitely interesting how, how people like Carl Jung 
have tried to deal with that problem where they've tried, where it's sort of like, I, I brought, I mentioned this before, but like in Carl Jung's answer to Job, he believes that God was this unconscious God for so long, but then he confronted Job and it's like, Job, no matter, he couldn't figure out Job. Job was this super righteous guy who was super obedient, but it's like, no matter what happened to him, he was still those things. And so it sort of forced him to confront the human suffering of that he had been causing, which eventually gave birth to Jesus. Mm. So it's kind of, and, and, so, and, and so that's a, yeah, that's a super interesting book to read just for that reason where like, or any book where any kind of theologian tries to deal with, okay, how do, how do we go from the old Testament God, this super wrathful, vengeful guy who it gets super jealous easily. How do we go from that to Jesus Christ in the Bible? Who's almost the exact opposite. Cause it's sure. a very weird transition going that's, from yeah, old to new Testament. And so it's, it's always cool to read how people try to rectify that. Sure. Sure. So um, I'm going to posit a, another category. So we've got Mosaic Judaism, sure. which is kind of Moses style religion, right? Moses, it's like an eye for an mm -hmm. eye, justice, revenge, and small in group, and everyone outside is evil. That's oh, Mosaic could you hang Judaism. On for a second? Yeah. All right, sorry. I just had to brighten up the room a little bit. Go ahead. That's fine. So we've got Mosaic Judaism, which is kind of a small circle of love. And then now mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to expand it to Nephite Christianity, right? In the Book of okay. Mormon, you've got the Nephite culture. The Nephite culture, they kind of expand their moral philosophy a little bit. And so the Nephites, it seems like their philosophy is we will never aggress. We will kind of treat you like a brother. And mm -hmm. but we but we will defend. We will defend with everything right. we have. Right. But we never aggress. They, and we, they, don't, we don't they seem like they're put into a very interesting situation there. Sorry, go on. Yeah, they they, they don't even take revenge, right? There's a key revenge mm -hmm. has been subtracted from Nephite morality, which is an interesting uh transition. Definitely. I, I think I, a lot of people view the Book of Mormon as that proper transition between Old and New Testaments. I mean, the Book of Mormon start, literally starts out in the Old Testament era, and then it ends in the New Testament era. And so it, it really seems like this cool, because between Old and New Testament, there's like 600 years that are lost, that you got to go and read Maccabees or something like that to figure out what was going on. There was there's still a lot of revenge fantasies going on there. But yeah, I think the interesting idea of the Book of is it's like, sure, it starts off with this family and then <clears throat> they leave Jerusalem because it's going to be destroyed. And the it's like the two older brothers are mean and don't don't like the younger brothers. And so they're they're constantly fighting. And then they get to America and the two the the two sets of brothers split off and create two different sets of tribes. And like the, the good brothers tribes, they try to stay righteous. And it's like at one point in the book of Enos, you have one guy, you have the one Nephite Enos, who's like praying for the Lamanites. And it's like, Oh, please. It's like, he, his heart literally turns to them and it's a very interesting situation going on there. <clears throat> but then there's a lot of fluctuation going on where like at one point the Nephites are the wicked ones and the Lamanites are super, super righteous. It's like, it's not just a one-to-one -one comparison. There's lots of flip-flopping back and forth where like at one point Jacob's like, yeah, you guys are being super wicked on this one point, but look at the Lamanites. They're actually like, they're actually doing a good job over there. And so, and there's a lots of like trying to get people to repent. And then you get to, the war chapters where it really just seems like the Nephites are really just going all out on being 
good and righteous and the Lamanites are going all out on being super wicked. <clears throat> but then it flips again. And then you have this Lamanite, Samuel the Lamanite, coming over and standing on a wall and being like, hey, guys, Nephites, you're supposed to be the righteous ones. What's going on? And they're like shooting arrows at him. And then Jesus comes and all of a sudden everybody's good again. Everybody's righteous. There's no more ites. There's no more enemies. Everybody's just super fr good friends with each other and they prosper a lot. And they, but then all of a sudden, both Nephites and Lamanites, just like after a while, they have children that just forget everything, all the teachings. And both tribes just go super, just way over into the, the wicked direction. And it's like all of a sudden they're doing cannibalism and it's like, holy crap. And they're, they're like forcing women and children to eat their husbands. It's like, what the hell is going on, man? <laughs> it's like, holy crap. I thought this was supposed to be a super chill, nice book. And it's like, all of a sudden, <laughs> you're introducing cannibalism and rapes and all that. And then it's like, yeah. literally, Moroni is like the only righteous dude left. And he's like, it's like, holy crap. These The last few chapters of the Book of Mormon are so freaking depressing because it's literally just... Mm. Moroni and he's like, I'm the only Christian left, guys. I'm so lonely. Everybody's hunting me. I don't have all my family's dead. It's like I'm just I just got these super heavy plates and that's all I got. And it's like, holy cow, that's how that's how the Book of Mormon ends. And it's like, and so it, yep. it's just, it's all about that, how revenge. How the revent? How the 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 originally the two older brothers were jealous of the mm. younger brothers because they 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 saw they thought that their father was favoring them over them even though the father kept trying to trying to love that all his children you know right because Nephi was being the righteous one right they just caught they they got so jealous of that and. All of a sudden, it just spirals into this massive ongoing generations conflict. And it's mm. it's just like, wow, talk about a butterfly effect. And so it's like, so and then you, you you can see that in real in in real life for like mm. you you hold on to this one grudge for too long. And then all of a sudden, these two warring factions are just going at each other. So the way I would think of that is back to my uh, cycle of friendship. So what what mm -hmm. the Nephites what the Nephites failed to do is they failed to prove that they were not the bad guys. So like they, oh, they had this cuz the for some reason the Lamanites kept thinking that these are the villains we need to destroy. Like we mm -hmm. don't have a book, we don't have a book of the Lamanites perspective, but for some reason it seemed like the Lamanites were constantly aggressing, you know what I mean? And so back to they were this, constantly this... digressing. It, it would be very interesting if one day, like we got the book of Laman. It's like, oh, <laughs> holy cow! <laughs> yeah. So back, based on these spirals, it's like uh, they kept spiraling downwards. And the Nephites, mm -hmm. they were like, the Nephites were trying to be good guys, but they never found a way to unwind the spiral. Because right, the, I, the, the problem is they 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 kept that tribal mentality even even when they were trying to be right the righteous ones, and yeah. because of that, it just eventually everything just spiraled out of control. Exactly, and so it it go it just goes to show that no matter even if you're trying to live the best life you can, if in the back of your mind you're still constantly viewing somebody as an enemy, then eventually it's just going to spiral out of control. That's a very good point. Like when you like the Nephites, they definitely had a superiority complex. Like oh, I think uh, that oh, absolutely. they saw themselves as so much better than those those savage Lamanites. They're so uncivilized, but we're we're the we're the good ones, you know. And so, how many undocumented offenses were there? Because it was just like, oh, these scum. We're just gonna like screw with their farm animals. Being, we're gonna encroach <laughs> upon their territory, and we're not even gonna mm -hmm. document it because we're just so we're so cool. You know what I mean? Absolutely, but, yeah. But the interesting thing about the Book of Mormon is the Book of Mormon gives examples of my definition of true Christians. Do you know who I'm thinking of? Mm -hmm. 
the anti Nephi Lehi's. Oh, right. The 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 Lamanites that got converted to Christianity and decided to lay down bury all their weapons. And right. I'm it's still debated to this day what it means to be an anti Nephi Lehi. It's like are they anti Nephi Lehi, but they're still Nephites? I don't know. <clears throat> there, it, there's lots of discussion on that, but ultimately they're they they join up with the Nephites, and then what's interesting is <clears throat> the war chapters happen, and they want to be able to defend themselves and fight with the Nephites, but they're like, oh wait, we buried our weapons and we made a covenant to never pick up weapons again, and that's when the the their sons are like, don't worry, Dad, we didn't make that covenant, so we got this, and that's where you get the two thousand Lamanites. You go out, or the 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 two thousand sorry, not Lamanites, two thousand stripling warriors that are, you know, the ultimate mama boys, and they they go out and they they fight, and none none of them die, none of them get injured. It's it's, right. but at the same time, I wonder if the fact that they never got hurt or injured probably built in built up into this superiority complex, in a way. Mm -hmm. So and that, now we got that, that happens all the time in the Book of Mormon. It's like they the Nephites are being super righteous, they prosper, but then they let it get to their head and they're like, Yeah, we're just so much better than those other guys. And then they they and then they fall again. And it's it's just rinse and repeat. And it's like it gets pretty exhausting after a while. For sure. So I'm very curious if you can you're in Japan, you should try to investigate if the guy who wrote Vinland Saga read the Book of Mormon, because <laughs> Thorfinn is your, you know, he's a prototype of an anti-Nephi Lehi. He's committed all this bloodshed. He's full of guilt. He's afraid mm -hmm. that killing, killing one more person will damn his soul. So he makes an oath to never wield the sword again. And in oh, the yeah. process, he becomes a prince of peace, basically. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh yeah, and then I, I almost forgot about that one famous story where the anti-Nephi Lehi's, after they made their oath and buried their weapons, the Lamanites are coming and they're like, oh no, what do we do? Well, we buried all our weapons, so let's just, they just kneel, they literally just kneel in prayer and allow the Lamanites to come and slaughter them. And it's like, holy crap. And a lot of the Lamanites start to feel really guilty about slaughtering these people that are just kneeling in prayer and they start to get converted and it's this super like crazy moment that it's like you can almost parallel that with Thorfinn getting the getting the crap beat out of him with those 100 punches it's like exactly. he just he just he's so tired of fighting that he just 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 beat me up man I don't I don't even care anymore I'm not I'm not gonna punch back right and the way I view it is when you engage in conflict you're you're mm -hmm. adding fuel to the narrative. Oh yeah, this is a villain. Look, he's getting all aggressive with me. He's confirming he's the villain I need to destroy. But when mm -hmm. someone is when someone's just kneeling and praying peacefully, like they're just completely debunking any narrative that this is the bad guy I'm supposed to kill. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know how to get in contact with the author of Inland Saga, but if I if I run into him, I'll have to ask him if he got any inspiration from the anti Nephi Lehi's. But yeah, exactly. So yeah, this is Thorfinn with his beat up face in the bottom left corner. That's after he he peacefully mm -hmm. just absorbed a hundred punches, proving I'm not your enemy, right? Mm -hmm. And simultaneously showing strength of character and showing and earning all this respect, you know. Right. And then it was the guy who was beating him up that was like almost unable to stand while Thorfinn was the one that was standing tall. Which is so, so poetic. It, it, he really, he really, it, oh, it absolutely is. It's almost like the guy was just beating himself up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to think of it. Your neighbor, yeah. treat your neighbor as yourself. You're hurting yourself, right? Mm -hmm. When you, when you truly love people as a brother, that's like, evolutionarily this is family it's your same genes you hurt your brother you're hurting yourself like like even an atheist could evolutionarily get on in line with that logic you know what i mean right hopefully
<laughs> so um, I wanted to do a, oh, man, an overview. Troll. Yes. I want to okay. do an overview. The of infamous trolley problem. Oh, man. All right. Let's get into it. Yes. So this is going to be relevant, but um, we have to just introduce the concept first. So the trolley problem, do I choose to kill one person to save five? Do I choose to sacrifice the minority to benefit the minority? That's Knut's philosophy. That's utilitarianism, right? Mm -hmm. The ontology, I have principles, right? I don't, I don't sacrifice anyone. Each person is, has rights and dignity. I have a duty to respect their right to life. I can't treat people as a means to an end. Therefore, I have to sacrifice the collective for the minority because the minority has rights. I have a duty to respect those rights. Mm -hmm. Right? Something like that, yeah. I'd say so. And so Thorfinn, he's occupying the deontological pathway. Thorfinn, he has a duty to not hurt anyone. So he has a duty to just not be involved. And so that's when you don't even touch the trolley, right? You don't touch the lever. Like, I can't get involved with any of this. And so if Knut wants to sacrifice the minority, go ahead, because I am I have a duty to not hurt anyone, right? Right. So in one of my blogs <laughs> and videos on morality, I talk about how to break a moral theory. And it's kind of... It, this is a lot of <laughs> philosophical sadism, right? It's like, oh, you've got an ethical theory. Let me destroy it, <laughs> right? So I'm going to give you the tools. All you have to do is exaggerate the trolley problem. So if someone... Well, that's, that's when the trolley really goes off the rails, you know? Um, when you... Yeah. It's sort of like, oh, okay, let's just kill infinite people to save this one person. Or I could save this one person and let the infinite people live and it's like at that point it's just a statistic you know that's that's as the saying goes one person is one person but a million people is a statistic so so okay let me explain my perspective and because it sounds like you're you've got a different angle on this so well, what i'm trying I to say i have a different angle on it but i, I have lots of thoughts on it you know okay so what I'm trying to communicate here is um, maybe someone does not want to sacrifice. Uh, maybe someone is willing to let the five die because they don't want to get involved with killing this one person, right? So the deontological sure. individual is like, not my problem, let the five die. But then you increase it to six. Not my problem, mm -hmm. let the six die. Increase it to 20. Not my problem, <laughs> let 20 people die. Once you you just keep increasing it, and then the question is, are you going to let the entire world die because you don't want to get your deontological fingers bloodied? You know what I mean? Right. And so you're putting and, a lot of pressure on the deontologist. Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of people would probably take a Christian spin on this where they would say the one person is Christ and the million people is us. Uh-huh. And so that's uh, the Christian perspective. It's okay to right. sacrifice the one for the many. And that's right. that's what gets a lot of people is it's like, oh, you're a you're a religion of about human sacrifice, and there's lots of you got to get into why what why is sacrifice necessary? And it it like this isn't even something that Carl Jung talks about even in his even in the answer to Job book. Like he he himself had to struggle with that concept. And, you know, I've had to struggle with it. I've made numerous videos talking about the atonement. <clears throat> but anyways, <clears throat> the, I think the thing about the trolley problem, at least my angle with it, is it's sort of nobody's ever going to be put into the trolley problem situation. There's a reason why it's metaphorical to begin with, is it's like you're never going to be put into a situation where you have to kill one person to save all these other people like that is an extremely rare circumstance and you're almost never going to be put into it and so it definitely 
it like while it's fun to think about and theorize i think ultimately not- it and it gets it gets so complicated like you have you seen um what is it called the good place the, sh- no. the tv show the good place it's a really interesting show that's like super ph- philosophical it's all about the afterlife and what if the afterlife exists what would be a good afterlife kind of an idea but they talk about the trolley problem in one episode and it's sort of like they literally recreate it and it's like oh what if the one person that you're killing was a doctor and only he had the skills to save all these other people but you just let the train run him over right right that goes back to how valuable are these people are we Mm -hmm. sacrificing a murderer or are we sacrificing a saint right sure and vice versa I think so I think I ha- the majority of people, if if the one guy is a murderer and he's just going to commit more evil acts, the majority of people would say, "Yeah, go ahead, kill that oh, one yeah. guy, get right. get it over it." Even if it's not like the socially appropriate answer to give, they're still mm-hmm. going to say they're still going to at least think that in their heads. For sure. For sure. Now, I have a massive disagreement with you that we have to address now that you have you have maligned <laughs> trolley problems as a phenomenon. <laughs> sure. So, and I think this is a common perspective, so it's worth addressing. So, mm-hmm. in my opinion, almost all of politics is a trolley problem. Every time, okay, uh, this goes to type one versus type two errors in statistics. There's, there's always an error. So like a vaccine. Well, this vaccine mm-hmm. could save, if we, if we force everyone to do vaccines, we're going to save a million people, but the vaccine has side effects and it's going to kill a hundred people. Do we kill a hundred people in order to save a million? That's a trolley problem, right? Mm-hmm. If we don't do anything, uh, a, mil- uh, a million die, but we save a hundred. But if we, if we do the lever, we save a million and kill the hundred. Right. The default well, track. That's kills, the interesting thing about human biology is there's always going to be side effects of some kind, no matter what kind of drugs you produce. That's why there's always going to that's why they're legally required to put out a million different side effects uh, on yeah. things. And it, it gets it gets to the point it gets to ludicrous degrees where it's like, oh, may cause diarrhea, may cause suffering and intense agony and death and oh okay so why am i buying this because there's still that one chance that it could help you that that one percent chance it could be super high it could be super low it's like it might kill you but you know it could also heal you so right and you know like whenever there are finite resources you've got trade-offs and whenever there's a Mm trade-off it's a trolley problem it's like are we going to reduce taxes for the rich and then the poor are sacrificed or are we going to benefit the poor and attack the rich that's a trolley rich versus poor which track do we flip you know abortion do we Mm -hmm. sacrifice the fetus for the mother or do we sacrifice the mother for the fetus etc you know what i mean right as the as long as there are trade-offs, as long as resources are finite, every policy is a trolley problem. That's why you should never get into politics to begin with, because you know what, <clears throat> you know what Kafka said said that one idiot is one idiot, two idiots is two idiots, a million idiots is a political party. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> I I have a love hate relationship with politics. I hate dealing with it, but I feel like it's probably the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, politics gets a lot of bad rap in general, and I don't like politicians in general. But, you know, if there weren't politicians, then there would probably be chaos, even more chaos than there already is. Yeah, I totally agree with that perspective. And so I guess, I don't know, maybe that right there is a trolley problem. Do we sacrifice an entire political party or, um, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, that's a big question. So I I can speed through this right here. I think, I think in general, yes, I think politicians are necessary. What I don't like is political parties. I don't, because that just promotes tribalism. 
uh, say that one more time. I I'm fine with politicians. The thing that I don't like yeah. is political parties because that's what promotes tribalism. Yeah. So like, like that's yeah. all you that's all you get in the media these days is uh, the left bashing the right and the right bashing the left and it's like why do we have political parties again? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, the American political system largely needs to be redesigned. But mm -hmm. no, nobody's ready for that conversation. Right. I'm not entirely sure how the how the political party system works in Japan. I'll have to do a little bit more research in that. All I know is that the American political party system they're they're way way too spread out. But in any case, let's get back to this trolley problem. Yeah, yeah. I I just want to go through some of this real quick so we can get back to Vinland. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> this right here, this is a way to break consequentialism or utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism, the idea that it's okay to sacrifice the one for the many. Like people do polls, right? You do, you can do a questionnaire. You ask people, is it okay to sacrifice one for five? But then you, you change the question. And you say, are you willing to commit violence against one person in order to save five? Most people say, no, I'm not willing to push this guy off of a bridge in order to save five. And so right. something about flipping a lever, you don't feel guilty, but like pushing someone to their death, you feel guilty. Right. And, and so there's a certain amount of hedonism. I would rather let five people die than feel the pain and right. agony of guilt. You know well, what I mean? Flipping a switch is so easy. Whereas trying to push yeah. a really fat guy over a bridge is super hard. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's, I think it's not just that you're, that it's, hard to push a guy like that over i think it's also that you're literally doing physical contact with the person you're literally right there shoving them onto the tracks even if it's a let's say it's a baby you're you got the baby in your hands it's easy to just chuck it onto the tracks but you can't because you're literally standing there holding it it's like oh yeah it's baby hitler go ahead and toss it but just the fact that it's a baby most people wouldn't be able to do it for sure. Yeah. And that's our common humanity. We all have an instinct to kind of right. respect other humans as the default, right? Mm -hmm. So this violates consequentialism because like, why are you not saving the five? Cons like if you care about the majority, you should do it, but they don't do it, right? And so they're violating their mm -hmm. own principle. Now, virtue ethics is super interesting. And I want to talk more about virtue ethics. Have you delved into like the Aristotelian paradigm much? Oh my gosh. I've, I think I have at one point, but go ahead and catch me up to speed. Yeah. So Aristotle, he builds this interesting framework. He transcends the normal paradigm. So like the Christian mm -hmm. or Jewish, the Jewish paradigm is like good versus evil, right? It's a, it's a binary right. bipolar paradigm, Jews versus uh, Philistines. Christians versus everyone else, whatever. It's, everything is framed we're the, in... We're the only ones that are going to heaven. Everybody else is is doomed to hell. Exactly. It's so like what this one pastor was like, oh, yeah, these Mormons are super nice. It's just a shame they're all going to hell. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Well, I'm glad I'm not in your religion. Right. There's no but, middle ground. It's just one or the other, right? No, and you know that's what's nice about the three kingdoms of glory is there is middle ground, but in any case, yeah, I I I definitely have a good understanding of Aristotle, at least a decent understanding of Aristotle ethics. So instead of looking at it as a binary where like gratitude is a virtue and ingratitude mm -hmm. is a vice, Aristotle says, what if you have too much gratitude? Too much of a virtue becomes a vice. <coughs> Right. Absolutely. You could talk about this in terms of chaos and order. I think ultimately, if you want to really simplify all this, I mean, Jordan Peterson, of course, talks about this all the time, but like, if you have too much chaos, it just turns into anarchy and everybody's killing each other. If you have too much order, you might as well throw everybody into a prison cell because that's what you're doing. And so there needs to be this fine balance between chaos and order in order to have, you know, those, the, those prime 
ethics. Mm. That's a really good way to put it. Uh, Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. likes to say you're, the correct place to be is riding the line between good or uh, riding the line between chaos and order. And that's the yin yang. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the I wouldn't line. say between good and evil. You know, I take a very Nietzschean approach to that where I think we need to get rid of concepts like good and evil altogether and just simply exist and treat others like humans instead of being like, I'm good, you're evil, you're my enemy. You know, mm -hmm. you need to go beyond good and evil. Uh, I like that. I like that. So uh, you can see different examples here. Uh, the, the most important example is the first one here, right? Cowardly mm -hmm. is it's a vice because you lack the bravery. And bravery sure. is the virtue. Mm -hmm. But if and you I think, I think bravery, you could, if you want to connect this back to Vinland Saga, that's sort of what happened to Canute. He went from cowardly and jumped right over brave and went straight to rash. Yeah, that's one way to put it for sure. And he he had to temper it. To, it, it he had to get that. He had to kind of mix those energies to get the mm -hmm. correct to get the correct amount. And so when we break apart these paradigms, Vinland Saga does something fascinating here where they deify a Viking vice, right? The Vikings mm -hmm. worshipped courage. If you die courageously, you go to heaven, right? But what, what, what uh, Thorfinn did, he said, actually, running away, that's the virtue. You guys all want to mock us for running from battle. I'm proud of my ancestors who ran away to Vinland or uh, to Iceland. You know what right, I mean? Right, to Iceland. He's, he's proud of the fact that his father did that. Yeah. He found a nice girl and wanted to live a quiet, peaceful life. And so that's what he did. Right. And so you noticed a really good point. Canute, he goes from coward to rash. And what does is, what is, uh, what is Thorfinn do? He goes from courageous to nihilistic. Oh, yeah. He's just a straight nihilist at the beginning of season two. He just, he doesn't care about anything. It's like he just stands there and lets a guy slash him up. And it's like, yeah, just, just kill me already. I'm just, I'm just so done with life in general. I'm so tired. But mm. what he needed to learn was to learn to live, to embrace life. And sometimes that means running. Sometimes that means actually holding your ground. And I think that's that's where he's going to be challenged the most is when should he be running and when should he be holding his ground and just being like, I mean, you can come at me if you want, but it's not going to end up good for either of us. Right. So I think the one... Like one thing I like to do is try to look at like, can we reduce these virtues and vices into their their parts, right? Are there little mm -hmm. parts that build up these virtues? And it's kind of complicated to do, but one way I like to do it is to say, um, cowardice is not being brave when you're supposed to. Like there's a time for bravery and you're not being brave at the right time. Courage is being brave at the right time Rash is being brave at the wrong time, right? Mm -hmm. But Vinland takes a little bit of a twist on this paradigm. Vinland says being rash is when you don't care about life. And so Thorkill is rash. He doesn't care about life at all. He's He has too much courage. Mm -hmm. And then being courageous is kind of being smart. It's like, I, I, I'm willing to risk my life for a goal. I'm willing to risk my life for revenge. I'm willing to risk my life to win, to get honor, to glory, prestige, greed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then cowardice It's a tool, is, and it all depends on how you use it. Right. Cowardice is I'm not, I'm not willing to risk my life for a goal, right? Mm -hmm. But um, interestingly... The, the the Thorfinn take on cowardice, he kind of elevates it to a virtue to where he says, you know, being cowardly, it's actually caring about life and preservation and peace more than anything. And so 
I'm not gonna give up lives or I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight, I'm not gonna be brave because none of those goals are good. The only good mm. goal is peace. The only good goal is not hurting people and not killing and preserving. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so courageous becomes a vice because all of those goals distract you from the good goal, the good goal of peace. Mm -hmm. But nihilism goes back. It's the inverse of rash. Rashness is like, I don't care about life, but I do care about killing. Nihilism mm -hmm. is, well, I, I don't care about life. I don't care about anything. So it's a passive rashness. You know what I mean? Right. So that's that's my take on the ethics, the <coughs> Aristotelian ethics of Vinland Saga. Mm. All right. Well, yeah, I there's definitely a lot to think about there. You're getting me thinking about all these crazy scenarios that we're talking about. And I think you definitely have to, well, see where the story goes, but we're definitely going to have to see how these ethics that Thorfinn has built up in himself get tested. I mean, narratively, you got to test it. It's like, okay, you, you believe in these things. Now let's see if we can break you, see if we can cause you to lose your ethics kind of a way, kind of a situation. What, uh, and if you can still withstand it. And I think for sure. there's, there, there, I'm, I'm worried for Thorfinn. I think there's going to be some crazy things that are going to happen to him that he's going to have to really be like, okay, is this a situation where I got to flee or fight? Right. Yeah. His, his, uh, his, uh, peace extremism is, is a like, pretty... what is his trolley problem going to be ultimately is the question. For sure. It's a very difficult mm -hmm. stance to take. To, to be unwilling to be violent in all circumstances. Yeah, and especially when you live in a Viking world where all that where all that's going on is violence, it's a, it's extremely difficult. It's like Thor's tried to live a peaceful life, but then he got sucked back into it and he ended up dying. And so it's like it's hard to live a peaceful life forever. You, and so you really just have to run away from the Viking world in general, and that's what. Thorfinn is planning to do to go, when he goes to Vinland. And it's mm -hmm. like, what kind of people is he going to encounter there? But, you know, you'll, we'll just have to wait and see. All right. So I, it's, it, we've been going for a while. I mm -hmm. think we can, are you thinking we're getting close to wrapping up here? Yeah, I think we could wrap it up. So I have one big point I would like to make before mm -hmm. we wrap it up and maybe see what sure. you think of this. So, Thorfinn makes this huge transition, right? He goes mm -hmm. from being just super, you know, rash or courageous to get to his goal of revenge to being this peace extremist, getting abused and whatnot. He kind of, he starts articulating some of his new philosophy. So he feels like he's in no position to judge, which is a Christian idea. Yeah. Um, he feels like he has no enemies, a Christian idea. He, he doesn't want to take up the sword or hurt anyone, a Christian idea. And he's willing to, you know, turn the other cheek, <laughs> another Christian idea. So he's got all of these ideas in his new philosophy. But um, there's also a big, strong element of, like, not judging is like a huge part of it. Like, I feel like not judging led him to all the other stuff. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I'm, dissect I'm dissecting why does he no longer judge these people? And I think I've figured it out. I don't feel like it was explicit. So I'm curious if you'd agree or disagree. For me, I think the reason is he understands that everyone is violent because like all human violence reduces to human blindness, right? And that's also mm -hmm. a, 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 it's a Christian concept, damn it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Jesus said, uh, before you uh, judge the person for having a moat in his eye, pull the stick out of your own eye, right? Get rid of your own blindness. Right. I'm not entirely sure judge. 
what what it means to what beam and moat mean, but the, it, essentially it is that idea that you got you got something in your eye, and it's causing you to be blind to another person's situation. So before you judge another person, and I you know the scriptures say judge righteous judgment, yeah. but you can't do that until you really self-evaluate yourself and figure out what kind of biases do I, am I holding on to? What kind of, literally, I think you could say any ideas that are causing you to view somebody as an enemy are most likely false ideas. They're, mm -hmm. it's, and so you, you got to be willing to get rid of those ideas. All right. That's the moat in your own eye or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think Thorfinn discovered the beam that was in his own eye, which was, Right. He had been he had been so blinded by revenge. He was so single-mindedly, you know, focused, monomaniacally obsessed with mm. getting Askeladd's head, you know what I mean? And he was willing to do anything. He was blind to others' suffering. He was blind to the atrocities, blind to the killing of Christians, blind to the burning of farms. And then mm -hmm. only only after a Scod, am I saying that correctly? Askeladd. Askeladd, yeah. Only after Askeladd was dead did suddenly the moat was out of his eye and he's like, holy crap, I've been blind this whole time. Look at all mm -hmm. this suffering I created. They had fathers. They had loved ones. I created all this same suffering for them. Right. I'm guilty of the same thing that I've been blind to this whole time. Something that I've been thinking about that, that rears, comes into my mind every once in a while is like, there's this one scene from Lord of the Rings, the two towers where like mm -hmm. um, it, it happens just after the, they encounter the elephants and those one guys come in and save Frodo and Sam and Gollum from being attacked. And they're like, they look at this dead soldier and they're like, you look at this guy and you wonder like, where did he come from? Why did he decide what decisions led him to this path that he, that he always, that he came on and now he's dead. And it's like, what kind of aspirations did he have? And it's like, what kind of life did he want to lead? And we just, we just took it from him mm -hmm. or I'm paraphrasing it, but right. they say something to that effect. Realizing the loss of their actions. Mm -hmm. Well, le realizing that another person that they just killed is actually a, a human being who probably right. knew who had who had a life of his own. He wasn't just this NPC that you could right. just go and kill and there was no backstory and, or anything like that. He was a real human. He 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 probably wanted to do something with his life and you just took that from him. Right. And so. When I, when I look at Vinland Saga through this lens, right? Look at mm -hmm. Vinland Saga through the lens of blindness, right? Askeladd, he kills because he's blinded by greed. You know, uh, his lieutenant kills because he's blinded by his love, uh, love for shedding blood. He just loves, you know, gore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, the King Canute, he's blinded by his, his, is a narcissistic desire for utopia. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like each character, each character kills because of their own unique blindness. Some people they're killing for honor. It's like, you disrespected my family. Now I have to kill you. Mm -hmm. You insulted me, honor, pride, you know, tribalism, all of these different types of blindness. And so it's almost, for me, it's almost poetic. It's teaching you a lesson of, Look at all the atrocities that happen due to human blindness and look at how Thorfinn, he pulls it out of his own eye and look at that transformation. Mm -hmm. It's, it's quite, it's one of the most <clears throat> crazy transitions in all of anime history. And it's like, it's really become a meme of its own where like you'll have Thorfinn saying, I have no enemies and it's just, yeah. It's really getting a lot of people to want to know what what's up with that, mm -hmm. what's going on, and it's almost such a, it's almost such a profound idea in our day and age. Yeah, but I think I think it ultimately goes back to that circle. If you expand mm -hmm. your circle of love wide enough, there's nobody outside of it, and 
it's the the people inside are family people outside are your enemies if there's nothing outside you have no enemies you know what i mean mm -hmm. absolutely so we got to keep trying to trying to expand that circle and i think i'm doing that by living in a foreign country and trying to understand these people that trying to learn their language and all that and well, good for you, man. I think that's so awesome. I think it's honorable. I think that's hugely valuable. Like when you like, mm -hmm. I've, uh, you can share those lessons over YouTube and like the whole oh, world will, will get benefit from your experiences. Uh, I applaud you and your efforts on that. Yeah. I don't, a lot of people don't realize this, but I actually wear a Buddhist bracelet. Like oh. that's the symbol for Buddha or something like that around like, around so i always got buddhism with me man i got this in yeah. london like a couple of years back giving charity to a buddhist monk of some kind and now i'm here and you know i gotta figure out what buddhism is really all about that's awesome don't forget to learn about Taoism too <laughs> oh yeah and Taoism, yeah oh Taoism is more of like a philosophy than a religion like just kind of a, a way of life but yeah, Buddhism and Shintoism, those are like the religions, whereas Confucianism and Taoism, those are more just kind of philosophies that you live, live and, by. But. It, it's, a, it's definitional. They have scripture <laughs> or philosophy books, whatever well, you want to call them. Yeah, they, they have books as much as Plato's Republic is a book. But yeah, <clears throat> it's still something you should I should be getting into more of. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Taoism is has some interesting philosophical uh, synergies. Right. Uh, I mean, I've 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 read I have the Tao Te Ching. I've I've read okay. it. It's it is a yeah. really interesting book. Yeah. So yeah. you're you're on you're on board with it then. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not too far from a Buddhist temple, so I go there sometimes. That's cool. Pretty pretty cool stuff. But anyway, yeah, I think that that I I can't think of anything more to add to this Vinland Saga conversation. It's been sorry, it's so dark in here for some reason. I hope you guys yeah, can you, see me well enough. I have my light on, but I guess it's not very bright. You're you're the yin to my yang right here. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying I'm trying to be your dark shadow uh, yeah, as yeah. best I can. That's that's good, man. Well, it's been a great discussion. Maybe there'll be more to come. Yeah, you know, when season three drops or something like that, I guess. Or let me know if there's any other anime you want to talk about. I always love talking about anime. Yeah, for In sure, fact, man. I, I, I did a poll of which anime I should make a video on next, and I got a, a Parasite the Maxim one out. So I got to make a figure out how to make a video on that and figure wow. out how I can make time for that. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> You pretty busy yeah, over there? Yeah, they keep me busy over here. You know, I get, I wasn't making any money on YouTube, so I got to figure out how to figure out some way to make money. For sure, for sure. And but also, I want to try to keep my channel alive somehow. But I'm still trying to figure out how best to go about doing that. But yeah. anyways, so I guess my next video will come out when it comes out, and I'm just so worried about everything else that's going on. But yeah, that's that's it. Good deal, man. It's been good to see you. Yep. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. <clears throat>